Okay, today on the show, I am joined by Dan Santat. And it's really interesting because Dan and I have already been speaking for 30 minutes about life. So yeah. I'm looking forward to this conversation because I feel like with you, it just, you never know where it's going to go. And I love your honesty and you are just, uh, it's great. It's, it's so refreshing. So uh, let me just speak to you a little bit about Dan. Um, for those of you who don't know him, I am I'm so honored to have him on the show. He's a number one New York Times bestselling author and illustrator of over 100 titles, which I'm on my first, so I can only imagine being at 100. So I just, I think that's amazing. He's also a Caldecott Medal winner, which if, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a highly esteemed award that recognizes the most distinguished American picture book for children. He's also, if that wasn't enough, he's also the creator of the Disney Channel series, The Replacements, which I know many of you know. Um, and um, the reason why he's on the show is also because next February, He's coming out with a book, A First Time for Everything, which is his awkward middle school, a memoir of his awkward middle school years and the trip to Europe that changed his life. So we're going to talk about that as well. So, Dan, I am so grateful that you joined me. Thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me, Erica. So I wanted to kind of, I know um, for those people that don't really know you, and, and like I said, I love that you're an open book. Can you kind of just tell us a little bit about you and your family? Uh, so, uh, I, I was born in Brooklyn, 1975. My parents were doctors from Thailand. Uh, and so culturally, you know, my parents raised me with a, like an Eastern kind of, you know, view from Thailand, from Bangkok. Uh, but you know, I grew up in a Western world. So as a result, I've just had this insatiable appetite to assimilate into this culture because my parents also wanted me to assimilate just so I didn't stick out and it wasn't awkward for me. So I think that was just bred into me from from birth. Uh, and as I got older, I got married. Uh, I have a lovely wife who uh, is a scientist. She works at Caltech. Uh, we met in college and we have two boys uh, who are right now, they are 17 and 14. Uh, and we try to, we try to, you know, let them engage with the world in the same, you know, energy and and excitement that I that I did. Uh, my wife, fortunately, she had the opportunity to go backpacking through Europe. Uh, I went off and got a second degree, so I never had the privilege. Uh, yeah. But I am, I am, I am, I am relatively well traveled. But I would like to go see more of the world, and you know, it's just exciting to see my kids um, approach the world with that same excitement. So that's my life. Yeah, and I, I do want to ask though. Kind of going back to your, you were trying to, your mom wanted you to assimilate just to protect you, right? And I, I, mean, I think it's sad that that's what you have to do. Do you ever wish it was, and I'm sorry, we didn't talk about this, but you just made me think, I mean, do you ever wish it was different? I mean, your mom, I think is doing what most moms, they want to protect you, right? Right. Um, what do you think about that? Because I mean, a lot of people come to the States from other countries and I imagine it's difficult, some with kids, some without. I mean. What do you think about that? Um, so it's interesting because my, you know, because I'm working on another memoir and it turns out that my mother never wanted to come to America. Interesting. You know, okay. and um, my father, when you, when, you know, it was interesting because back in the day when my father lived in Thailand and he would hang out with his friends, your knowledge about Western culture, your knowledge about America was its currency in terms of giving you like street cred of coolness, right? So my father was like a huge fan of Elvis and Paul Anka, and, you know, and a lot of old movies, you know, you know, like Shane. Shane was like my father's favorite, you know, movie back in the day. And coming to America was kind of like his dream. He wanted to come and just and just, you know, see America. I don't think the intention was to um, to stay long term like he wanted. He was a doctor. So he came, moved to Brooklyn, uh, was going to do his residency. And then after two years would go back to Thailand. But the Thai government, I think they took offense because my father got a free education from 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 the government of Thailand to become a doctor. And That's to see my right. father just like hop on a plane and do his residency in Thailand, I think that was enough in a, of an offense for them to say, like, no, no, you can stay there. Like we, you know, you can go out there, take the education that we gave you and you can go off and make your fortune because there's other doctors who have a lot of pride in this country and they'll stay here. And so my mother who came with him, she was just stuck in this place where she just felt alienated. Like she didn't understand anything. She was very close with her family. 
And my mother, you know, she has an autoimmune disease. She has lupus. So, you know, that limits her ability to travel around a lot. And as a result, I think there were certain regrets that she had where life just kind of seemed to stop or she stopped life on her own because of her health reasons. She needed to stay close to, you know, a community of doctors and things like that to, to make sure that she would be OK because she just wanted to raise me. And as a result, like I was the only child that she had, you know, she wanted she had told me she wanted four kids and I was the only one. And there was a there was like this weird, tremendous amount of guilt that I had where I said, well, I have to live up to your expectations. All right, yeah, okay. And so, you know, and so my parents were always saying like, well, you have to grow up and be a doctor. We want you to be a doctor. And then, and, you know, for the longest time, I thought I owe it to you to be a doctor. I have to grow up and be a doctor. Um, and it wasn't until I got into college where my friend said, you know, you don't have to be a doctor. It's your life. You can do whatever you want to do. And they're the ones that just kind of said, well, why don't you see if you can get into art school? And so I, I applied without my parents knowing and I got in and that's where my life changed. Um, and, you know, I think a lot about the fact of sacrifices that my parents made. Um, and really what they did, they like they sacrificed their identity. They they they. They almost they pretty much sacrificed their Asianness and and you know understanding that there would be this complaints where you know they would say to me you know when I was a kid like you're so American you're so American and I I kind of took that as an offense because I thought well you know you never I never asked to be here you know like yeah. you, I was raised in this country and now you take offense to the fact that I'm the product of my niche, you know? And so it wasn't until I had a better understanding of my parents just doing a full interview and understanding who they were and why they were the, the way they were that I understood the sacrifices that they made. And you appreciate that to a level of, it's beyond parents and kids. Because I do feel like there's this case where a lot of I do feel like there's a case where a lot of parents won't tell their kids certain things because they want to kind of give off this aura of, I don't know, just this spotless perfection. Yeah, or we have it together. We have it all together. Right, we, we have it together. Anyone. You're under control. But what I find, what I find actually more engaging with my kids is if you tell them the things you messed up on and the little things you screwed up on. It makes you more human and as a result it makes you more relatable and so it gives my kids this willingness to tell me things that maybe they don't feel good about or maybe makes them feel awkward or embarrassed because they understand that i experience the same things you know so the relationship that i had with my parents you know it was with the intentions of me assimilating into this country but then whenever i asked them anything about what it was like when they grew up they wouldn't tell me anything and as a result, we had this distance. We had this distance. And I, I, you know, and it wasn't until it was funny because, it, you know, when I asked them about their lives, saying, telling them that I was writing a memoir. There was something in their brain that switched like, that kind of presented it as, oh, this is an assignment like you need this information. Oh, well, then we'll tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I can't get it out of you. Right, unless, right. Unless and, I write about you. As a result, like, you find out why your parents are the way they are. And it used to be that you would take it personally because you didn't understand where this point of view came from, you know? And so it wasn't until that moment where I realized I don't need to, I don't need an apology. I don't need to, un, you know, I don't need you to see my point of view. I just need to understand why you are the way you are. And that makes all the difference in the world. And my, you know, my mother did the best she could in a foreign country that she was unfamiliar with, you know? And so for that, I'm grateful. And um, look, I mean, like, I get to do what I do for a living. I do well. Uh, I can take care of my family. Uh, so, you know, they did a fabulous job, as, as I can see. Well, and you tried to understand your father more at 15, right? That was your first trip to Thailand, right? Uh, yeah, so I went to Thailand and honestly, it was, oh God, it was, unfortunately, it was the only time I went to Thailand. My parents, my father never really had a close relationship with his family, so he was always reluctant to go back to Thailand. Uh, the reason why we went back to Thailand was because my mother had breast cancer 
And when she was recovering, my grandmother, the only grandparent that I knew, she was the only living grandparent that I had, uh, she wanted my mother to go back and perform this Buddhist ceremony for like luck and longevity. And so that was the one time I went back to Thailand and I met the rest of my family, like, you know, the cousins and aunts and uncles who I'd never met before. And it was just this whole other half of myself that I didn't know anything about, you know, and I found that I found that to be a really life changing experience because, you know, I grew up in a small white rural you know, Christian farming town just outside of Los Angeles. And being an Asian American in the 80s, you know, like pop culture really, you know, pressed it upon you that, you know, Asians in this country were the jokes, you know, they were the ones to be laughed at because they talk funny, you know, and, 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 you know, they, you know, they ate weird food and things like that. So it was always the butt of the jokes in pop culture. And so, you know, me growing up, a lot of my understanding of how the world worked came from pop culture, you know? So you would watch those movies and you would engage, you know, with like books and comic books and things like that. And then you would see that narrative being played out like, oh yeah, the Asians are the funny people, like they're the weird ones, right? And I, I remember sitting there thinking to myself, is that my role here? Am I supposed to be the funny guy? Am I supposed to be the joke, you know? And I kind of just fell into it because in terms of cultural pride, like it was nowhere to be seen. And and not only that, being Thai American, you know, I growing up in a community where, oh gosh, maybe like less than 5% of the town I grew up in had an Asian community, but you have a subset of other Asians in that community. You had Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Filipino, but we were literally like the only Thai people in that town. So mm -hmm. in 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 order to get any information about my own personal culture, I had to get it from my parents, but you know, they were tight lipped about it. They never really talked about it. And there was no one else that I could talk to or relate to, you know, like I would go to a Chinese new year party or something like that. But like all the other Chinese kids, like they would go through their Chinese traditions and I would just kind of follow along and be like, Oh, not really Chinese, but I guess this is what Asian people do. So yeah. for years I was just swimming out in a raft alone out at sea, just, not knowing who I was. And it wasn't until that trip to Thailand when I was 15, where I realized this is what Thailand is. And, you know, and, you know, I personally find it, I find it important to have, you know, you don't have to have a warm embrace with it, you know, like come to terms with like, oh, I am Thai American, but get a good idea of who you are and where you came from and that will make a huge difference in terms of your own personal identity and your confidence and you know just understanding like those parts of you that you don't really know about and that helps you to connect with your parents a little bit more to understand Absolutely. right yeah Absolutely. yeah you know like you know there was those things that maybe you argued about and you realize oh so for example like my parents they never understood why I wanted to be an artist, right? They were like, what do you mean? Like, why do you want to be an artist? Like, you can't make any money doing that, right? And it wasn't until I went to Thailand where I was looking around, and I remember this one specific moment. I was, I was at my cousin's house, and we were playing uh, PlayStation. We were playing a PlayStation game. But the entire game was in Japanese. Mm. And, I, and I looked at my cousin, and I said, what are we supposed to do in this game? Like, how do we play this game? And he looks at me, he says, I don't know. I don't read Japanese. And I said, well, why are we playing a Japanese game? Like, why are we doing this? And he says, they don't make Thai PlayStations. Like, if I want to play a PlayStation, huh. I have to get whatever I can get, right? Like, and so at the time, Thailand in the 1980s, they were engaging with culture just by, like, grabbing onto other things from other cultures. You know, movies in America, uh, you know, movies, comic books in Japan, things like that. But as as their own country, they were still a developing third world country. They didn't have their own expression of pop culture. They didn't have their own cinema. Mm. They didn't have their own. I mean, they had their own music, but but you know, they were they were still in the process of learning and not really kind of adding to the zeitgeist of of the pop culture at the time, right? And so. I remember going back there and looking around and realizing that 
no one in the Thai community was actually making their own art or telling their own stories with their artwork. And that was because the only people in the country at the time that were doing that were the Buddhists, like the monks that worked in, in temples and stuff like that. Wow. So that's when I understood like, oh, it's not that you want, it's not that you want to deprive me of art. It's just, you don't understand you don't get it. Yeah. that you can actually make a living being an artist. Right. So even to this day, cause like, I had this wacky trip. I went out to Uzbekistan, you know, and I remember, I remember I was speaking to some people and they said, well, what, you know, what do you do for a living? And I said, oh, I'm a children's book author. And, and the response that they would give me was, you make fairy tales, which to me is a very dated kind of perception of what yeah. children's storytelling is. Yeah. And I'd have to say, well, I guess I do contemporary fairy tales, but there's no <laughs> elves or like wizards and things like that. I'm just yeah. telling stories to children. So the idea of making an, a living as an artist, you know, in the wealthiest nation in the world is still very foreign to a lot of people. Like, wait, you can be an artist? You're like, you can make a living doing that? So, but it's until you traveled that you realize that, though, right? I mean, you and I had a big conversation about that. Get out right. of your bubble because you don't realize right. not every country, not everyone's raised like you are. Your mom, your parents, they didn't know that because that's not what they were raised with. Right. You know, right. when you went and traveled to Uzbekistan, I mean, that was that was recent. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why you have to get out there and see that the rest of the world isn't like you. They don't think like you because they weren't raised around the same thing. They didn't have, they don't have the same culture, which. Right. And I think a lot of people like they'll get their information from, they'll get their information off social media and they'll just say, oh, oh that's what Paris is like. Oh, that's what, you yeah. know, wherever is like. But you don't really get the understanding of a place until you go there and you assimilate with the culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, even for 24, 36 hours, you know, like I, I just glommed on to, you know, someone from Uzbekistan and I was just like, tell me everything about you yeah. like because you know because i said i only have 36 hours here i just want to know as much as i can about this country and i think the best way to understand it is by getting to know you yeah you know? and there just seems to be this i don't know if it's an american thing or if it's a global thing in general but like there's this lack of interest in wanting to go explore beyond your small town view you okay. know dan i'm gonna hold you there because i want to get into your book and i know that <laughs> that's going to come up on your book as well so before we i don't want to skip over your book but i know i do want to go there with you so that's, yeah. a, that's important to me i do want to ask you one question though before we leave your whole experience in thailand since your dad kind of had that view of you're American now, how, how was the rest of your family when you were there? I mean, at 15, you were pretty American. So how did they treat you and how did they react to you when you went there? Uh, it was it was exciting. They they embraced me with open arms, but, yeah. you know, they definitely. It, it was interesting because, you know, the one thing that I remember my relatives saying is like they would make fun of my father's accent. You know, like he had been living in America long enough and same with my mother that that it was an Americanized Thai accent or mm -hmm. maybe they forgot how to say certain words because they hadn't said them in many years. Um, and I remember they would get they would get teased by by, you know, their siblings saying like, oh, my gosh, you're so American. Like you, you don't remember what it's like to do this or that. And, you know, with my parents, I think they realized, oh, my gosh, like. We're neither fully American and we're neither fully Thai. And so we're just kind of stuck in this limbo. And, and ultimately for me, like, I think that was the biggest sacrifice that they made coming to this country for, you know, for the purpose of, I don't know, like, it was easier for me to grow up in America because I was born there, right? Yeah. And and so um, it was their identity that they sacrificed, right? And then, you know, so, uh, you know, my one of my cousins came here. Um, she lives in Australia, actually, and her husband his her husband's this wonderful, you know, British man named Gavin. And I hadn't seen her. I hadn't seen her since that trip to Thailand. And, I, you know, it'd been easily over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was it was just great to see her and connect with her and just catch up and see how 
because she grew up she grew up in Thailand and she never got to see any of the world because at the time there was no social media there was no internet and so when she had the opportunity you know she decided to study abroad in Australia and when I saw her it was this completely different person because you know seeing her in Thailand she would ask a lot of questions like what is it like out there mm. you know i like tell me about what america's like tell me what that world is like uh and now you know being in australia and her her and her husband they travel every year to some place new like she she has seen more of the world and it's not so overwhelmingly intimidating you know and it, it's just right. amazing yeah. yeah and it's just amazing you know talking with her and saying, oh, next year we're going to do this. Next year we're doing that. And I'm just like, you already have it planned out. You already know where you want to go next, which is absolutely exciting, right? I mean, my family, they can be a little picky about where they want to go. So, you know, my <laughs> wife and I are celebrating. Like, it's funny because, like, my wife and I are celebrating our 20th anniversary next year. And I said, oh, Paris would be a great place to spend, you know, 20th anniversary. And, of course, my kids are just like, ugh, Paris. Ugh. <laughs> We want to go to Japan, you know, and it's like, I Japan's guess. Japan's like the new Japan, place right now right? because my son's all about Japan as well. Like, hey, okay, that's that's not your typical American vacation, right? So, hey, right. I like that you're trying new things, new places. Right. But I also tell them, like, you have to understand how extremely privileged you are to even say that you get to leave the country. Most people yeah. do not get to leave the country. And here you are rolling your eyes like, oh, Paris. You've never even been to Paris. Yeah, you know, and that's true. Already, I mean, that's a really good point. It's good that you call them out on it, too. Yeah. Like, do you understand I'm lucky you already even say, like, as if it's even a concept to you that you aren't going to go here when every other kid would be like, another country? You know, that's right, good that right. you call them out I mean, on it. You know, I mean, I just, I just remember, I just remember going, I remember going to uh, the book warehouse, the Hachette book warehouse out in Indianapolis, you know? And I was talking with the I was talking with the people that were helping me there, and they spend they spend their weeks, months, years in this warehouse, like shipping books around and things like that. Their whole lives are pretty much in this warehouse. And I say, when you go on vacation, like where do you go? What do you do? And they and they look at the they look at me and they said, well, we have barbecues and we watch you know Indianapolis Colts football. And I said, do you? go out of town, you go someplace, you travel. They looked at me and they said, well, why? I said, what do you mean? Your whole life is in this building. You've seen less than 1% of the world and you have absolutely no interest in seeing the rest of it and you're just completely settled here. Like, I mean, to each his own, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't, I can only talk about like how beautiful the rest of the world is to engage with, but you know, you can't, you can't make someone come out of their, little bubble unless they really want to but you know what i implore is that you guys you know like the reason why everyone is so opinionated and doesn't want to engage or talk about anything is because they're so comfortable in their little nest that they grew up in that it finds the rest of the world completely terrifying to engage with and that i think that is why you kind of see this this gap among um, among cultures you know it's like they go on social media and they say Oh, okay. Like I know, I have a good idea of what Paris is like, but you know, it, it's a it's a it's a curated view of what Paris is, and so it may not be something that you like. It may be something that maybe you find offensive, and you go, "I will never go to Paris because of that one thing." And it's just like, well, that's that's a very shallow view, and I, you know, I hate. Maybe that's maybe maybe someone will be offended by me saying that, but you know, it, it's it's unfair to say like. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to assess my entire view just based on this. That everyone does that. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, when I was in Singapore, you know, uh, this this person that I was supposed to be, uh, you know, doing a keynote panel with, uh, you know, he wanted to take me to this hawker center where you know they have all these exotic foods from from Singapore, and he brings me this plate of food. He said, "I will not be offended if you do not eat this because." Uh, what we have here is pig small intestine, large intestine, and rectum. But it's my personal favorite dish. I love this. And, you know, just like if you really wanted a taste of Singapore, like here it is on a plate. And, and I and I invite you to try it. Uh, but if you don't, I will not be offended. And I said, listen, I 
don't want to give the impression that I am better than any other culture, you know? In some place, if they saw this plate of food, there are people starving in this world. They would kill for this plate of food. Yeah. So who am I? I find, I find eating to be a privilege, you know? And so at the same time, I was looking at it and I said, listen, in America, we eat hot dogs. And that is literally the byproduct of the byproduct of the thing that goes to the cutting room floor and they scoop it up and they turn it into like this weird sausage, which you can't technically even call meat. Nope. So <laughs> you're showing me this and you're telling me that it's from the butt of a, of a, of a pig. At least I know where it's coming from. <laughs> You know, because if I were to tell somebody what a hot dog was, they'd say, are you out of your mind? Why are you eating that? You know, that's, like, know, right? that's yeah. the cultural difference. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to eat it because you love it. And if, if I if I eat it and I find the pleasure in it, then I will understand why you you like it so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I ate it. And honestly, dear, dear viewer, it was amazing. It was delicious. And then going and then going to Uzbekistan right after that, I got this beautiful the noodle, it was like this noodle dish with this dark brown meat and I was ready to scoop into it. And, and uh, you know, and my friend from Uzbekistan, she said, wait, before you eat that, you should know that the, the meat in that dish, uh, this is a dish called narin and it is, it is delightful. It's a, it's a, it's a popular national dish, but that meat there is horse. And I said, oh, I have never had horse before. She says, "Well, it is a delicacy here, and, you know, and you, and it's a, it's 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 only served at very special occasions. Uh, but uh, you should also be aware that, you know, I guess eating horse meat has been known to really elevate your blood pressure quickly." Oh, and I said, "Yeah." And I said, "Okay, well, thanks for the warning." Uh, and again, I gave her the hot dog analogy, and I said, "At least I know this is horse, uh, and maybe you know, there's this perception that, you know, like, oh, we can't eat certain animals because they have too much charm and personality, right? And I said, you know what? In this country, they had to eat horse to survive or whatever, or they find it important. And I said, you know what? Like, I'm no better than anything else. You know, like, let's do this. And I ate it. And it was, it was delicious. It was delicious. You know, I felt a little warm. Maybe I was sweating a little bit. Maybe my blood pressure was elevated. I don't know what it was, but you know, I can say like, I have had, I have had Narin, I have had horse. And you know what? I just had peck rectum, pig rectum in Singapore. So at this point now, if you put anything in front of me, like I'm pretty sure I'm game to try it, but. Yeah, you know. and, but it's like, you wouldn't have known that unless you would have traveled and that's their culture. You know, right. we have things that are part of our culture right. and it's, I don't know, this makes me think like it's, I don't think it's okay to shame someone for eating something just because you've been raised to believe it's only a pet when yeah. that's their culture. That's what they know. I, I right. had a, a college roommate who was uh, Vietnamese and she was embarrassed because her family before they came over was so poor, they had to eat dog. Right. Right. And she was ashamed. And it's like, I'm not going to punish you or shame yeah. you because that's what your family had to do to survive. I don't know what it's like growing up there, but I can only imagine what it's like to be so poor that you're going to eat whatever you can, Absolutely. you know? And that's even what it's this, like. Even in, uh, even in this country, you know, I had some friends, I had some friends who lived down in the deep, deep South. Um, you know, they would tell us stories, you know, like we were, I remember I was in college, I was in a dorm and they would tell us stories tell me stories of eating raccoon and squirrel and turtle yeah. you know and i remember thinking like what what is you know and he was a really good storyteller so he would tell us you know about making turtle soup and and, and things like that and and actually i was i was fortunate enough i was in new orleans uh for for a book conference i think it was like ncte or, or something like that and i was there and I was with uh, I was with an author friend of mine, and he said, "I will have the turtle soup." And I said, "I too will have the turtle soup." <laughs> you know, we got turtle soup, and I ate the soup, and I said, "This is amazing. This turtle soup is so good." And he's like, "Every time I come to New Orleans, I always order turtle soup." You I'll know? have to try that then. I always see it on the menu every time I go. But it's I'm not, so good. It's so is good. it? See, yeah. I'm not. I don't. I'm. I'm one of those for new things. I like to try new things, but. Yeah. Like there's so much good food in New Orleans that it's like, do I want to chance it with something that may be good versus something I know is good, you know? Right, 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 just, right. Yeah. And, but if someone else gets it, then it's like, oh, can I taste it? And then I'll get it. I just don't want to waste a good meal. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, like, I'm like you, you know, I'm like you in the sense that 
even when I travel, I don't like to go to the same place twice because it's like there's a whole planet to go around, you know, like we have a place in Hawaii. My love, my wife likes to go to Hawaii twice a year. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm kind of over Hawaii. Yeah. I don't want to sound, I don't want to sound elitist, but I'm over Hawaii. I want to go see Rome. Yeah, the world out there, see, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I get it. You know, my wife is a creature of habit and it's just like, I, I really need a taste of something else because Hawaii is driving me a little nuts. And I yeah. know, I know that's coming from a place of privilege, but you know, honestly, it's, I, I, I'm just dying to see the rest of the world. So going to Singapore, going to Uzbekistan, you know, and places like that, it was, oh, it's just such a breath of fresh air. It was amazing. Yeah. And even, even within a country, there's so many places you can go, right? I've gone to Italy right. a few times because I want to go to different places within it, you know? Right. Um, right. So there's, there's, <laughs> I, I don't want to say this bad either, but there's too many places to see to waste on one place. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right, right, right. And I don't, and I, I mean, I've heard beautiful. stories. Yeah. I've read, I've read articles. There's like people that try to hit every country in the planet. Right. And I guess there's, there's people, there's some people that do that. Right. And, and like, they'll, I, I, to my understanding from what I read in the article is like, there's always like these six, countries or so that are just really dangerous for Americans to go to because of, you know, like political tensions and things yeah. like that. And the person's just like, you know what, like, I need to check it off my list and I'll do whatever I can to do it, you know, yeah, so go that. there. And I remember reading this article, the guy goes to, I think it was like, I think it was like an airport in Afghanistan. And I don't know what it was, but he immediately like got taken into custody you know, once he set foot in that country. And then he was in a prison for like a month and a half. And it took him, you know, I don't know how long to, yeah, to to actually get extradited out of the country. But, you know, it was one of those things where he kind of just, he, he was telling, he was, he was talking about like all these horrible things that happened in the prison and just kind of scratched his head and wondered like, well, was it worth it? You know, like, well, now I only have to worry about five more countries. You know, so. Yeah, well, not even the smaller the countries like that. Uh, actually, a podcast that launched today, a previous yeah. guest, her family got arrested in China. Oh, my gosh. They, yeah. And they, they, I mean, obviously, they're okay. But talk about their experience. I mean, they were deported and it was, it was, but yeah, they were arrested in China. So I'm like, it's interesting you what. say that because, because, you know, uh, going to Singapore, who are, who are kind of like, internationally known for having these draconian laws like oh you can't chew gum you can't spit you know and and things like that and then going and then going to singapore and you know engaging with a local and and just saying like yeah what's up with those laws and they say well don't actually enforce them you know mm. people are chewing gum you'll see people spit it's not like someone's going to like come out there and like arrest you and cane you you know but it's there to just scare you into saying like look don't do those things so that we can keep this country clean you know yeah. yeah um and i remember asking him like well do you do you mind having that view of your country perceived out in the world if i were to google you know you know laws in singapore it's not painted in a very good light and he said well you know it's worth it to keep this country so clean and beautiful and singapore spotless I've it heard, is I've heard very clean, right? Yeah. And at the same time, he says, look, but we're having this conversation now. You're getting to know me. You understand where we're coming from. And it's like, it's not meant to be, you know, like this super strict, you know, third world place where we're going to punish you for every little infraction. It was, it was set there a long time ago. And everyone just has this understanding, like, don't do these things. But also, if you come to another country, are you going to spray graffiti on the wall? Are you going to like defile like things around our country? Like you're being a rude guest. And I said, fair enough. I understand. You know, so yeah, it's, really it's trying to understand their culture and where they're coming from. It's you took the time to understand, and he took the time to explain it to you. You know, right. and it didn't it like it was only like you know it didn't take more than ten minutes of our conversation. Yeah. You know, so that's. And I can't really say much about America. You know, it's just like, well, you know, people open carry guns in certain parts of the country and they shoot people, you know, like I can't, I can't brag. Yeah, we have our own issues, right? right, right. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about your book, your memoir, A First Time for Everything. 
So I kind of want to get down, kind of start at the beginning because it's about you taking this trip to Europe when you were in middle school, right? But right. it wasn't like, let's go to a trip. You weren't exactly thrilled to go on this trip, right? No, no. So, you know, when you're a kid and you grow up, your lack of experience in life is the thing that makes you so quiet because the entire world just seems so big and so intimidating. And when you're growing up in a town, especially someone like me being an Asian American kid in this small white rural Christian town, you know, it it's hard because the only the only belief system you have about yourself is what other people say about you. And so I'm growing in this town. Kids are picking on me because I'm the Asian kid. And, you know, like I, I don't get certain things because my parents, they just didn't. Like, for example, I didn't know who Santa Claus was because my parents, we don't have Santa in Thailand. Right. Oh, and so I go there and I'm in kindergarten, by the way. And I'm sitting there and my teacher's like, well, Santa's going to come. And I was just like, who's Santa Claus? And the kids are like, you idiot. Like everyone knows that there's this fat man that comes down the chimney and leaves presents under your tree if you're a good kid. And of course, I just kind of had to fall in line and be like, oh yeah, of course, I'm stupid because obviously a big fat man comes down the chimney and gives presents to every kid in this planet, right? And you know, I quickly just said, okay, I need to get into this, this, this holiday thing. I'm gonna be a good kid so I can get my presents. And I bought in, like I decorated the tree, you know, I, I, we did the lights and everything and then, and then on Christmas Day, two presents were under the tree. One was from my parents, and the other one was from Santa in my mother's handwriting, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I and I thought to myself, like, okay, well, it worked, you know? I got a present, Christmas, this Christmas thing, I'm all on board. And then I go back to school, and there was this punk kid. His name was Jacob Boyd. And you remember? Kid, <laughs> that, <laughs> and that kid, like, he stole kids' bikes. He, like, ate people's lunches. He, he broke other kids' oh, wow. toys. Like the kid was a punk. The kid was a punk. And he came to school, he's like, yeah, yeah, Santa brought me a dirt bike and he bought me like the X-Wing fighter and the Millennium Falcon and the new Atari system. And I thought to myself like, wait a sec, this kid who is rotten to the core got everything he wanted from Santa Claus despite the fact that he's a total punk. Uh -huh. And I got two presents. And unfortunately, it was like it was one of these things where very early on, I got very skeptical and very cynical about childhood. And it was just like, you know what? I don't think I'm being dealt a full deck of cards here. Like, I'm not being told the truth because I, I followed the rules and I did everything I, I could. And then this guy absolutely did not follow the rules and he still got the entire world given to him. And it was, mm -hmm. I just found that very, I found that very uh, just dismissive when it comes to kids. And it's just like. You know, I just wish someone just told me the truth. And, you know, and that was just, I don't know. So that, that was my view about living in a small town like that. And as a result, like, there was a, there was a, I harbored this resentment for this town. Like, I don't want to say, yeah, no, I'll say it. I'll say it. I felt like I was too good for the town. Especially when you get a taste of life outside of that town. And then you realize, oh, if I, if I grew up, just in LA, just in Monterey Park, just a half hour away from here, surrounded by other Asian kids, I would be a completely different human being. I would have, I would have so much more confidence in myself. I wouldn't feel so little. And, and it doesn't take much, you know, just to get a little, a little taste of the world, right? And so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to. It's wrong of me to say, like, I'm, I'm too good for the town because I'm not because, you know, there are certain communities that there, there's a beauty to them, to my small town that they're very close knit. Uh, like, for example, uh, one of the kids that I grew up with, uh, you know, his name's Jaime Jaquez, very talented athlete, very talented, you know, um, just gifted athlete in basketball, you know, and, and all these other sports. Anyway, his son, Jaime Jaquez Jr., is the starting center for UCLA. And you see this entire town just gather around and celebrate this kid because he is doing something magnificent and they just kind of take it as a representation of the community. And I think that's something that's very beautiful 
you know, in that respect, you know, the, 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 the town can be a little bit more conservative for my liking, but, you know, I'm watching, I'm watching this, the son of this kid that I grew up with. And there, there was this, there was this sense of pride that I had. And I said, yeah. you know, if it was a bigger town, I don't think people would care as much, but because it's a small town and, and, you know, you get your, you get your victories where they are. And it's like, you're watching this kid make it to the final four and you can celebrate that. And the entire community you know, gets together and they and they and they praise that. And I think that's something beautiful about living in a small town is that the little things or the big things are just beautiful. You know, I'm just not I'm not cut out for small city living because I need to I need to go out there and see the world because there's something. So here's my view. I think people get really caught up in making mistakes you know like if they make mistakes they feel like it's the end of the world like oh my god my life is ruined because like i made a mistake but there's something beautiful about going out there and seeing the immense size of the world and understanding that you as a person are completely insignificant to the sense that if you made that one mistake in the scope of the entire universe it means nothing. You will survive. You will be okay. And so going to Europe and leaving that town and seeing that there's a world out there where there are people who are friendly, who do not think the way that town thinks, and they embrace me with open arms, it it changed the way I was thinking about myself. I realized, oh, this town thinks of me of a certain way, but I am not defined by that town. And that's the importance of leaving the city. And it was a really huge boost to my confidence because I realized there at the time, I think there was like 5 billion people on the planet. I'm going to connect with somebody in that world. It doesn't necessarily have to be in that town who living in that town after 13, 14 years has kind of just typecasted me a certain way. Uh, And that's the issue is that when you're a kid and you have no life experiences, you just glom on to other people's opinions and you hold it to be true because you think, well, if everybody in this town thinks I'm a dork, then I must be a dork, yeah. right? And so it isn't until you leave that town and then you engage with other people who think you're actually a pretty nice, cool dude that you realize, oh, just the people in this town think that I'm that way, but the rest of the world does not. And that that's, it just, it was a hard reset into my mindset about myself and that's why I find it so important and like such a such a defining moment in my childhood because it really it was just three weeks and it just taught me to learn to like myself yeah so you got so much out of that but and and I think for why do you think you had no desire to leave initially my initial thought was that because everyone typecasted me in this town that the rest of the world was going to think the same way. Okay. Like, well, if the, if these people think I'm this way, I don't want to go out into the world where everyone's going to be like, look at this, look at this little dork in Salzburg, right? You know, I didn't want I didn't want to be revealed that the truth was that I was this I was this dork. Like, I didn't want to be bullied by the planet, right? Okay. Like, that's even okay. more overwhelming. Like, oh my gosh, like the world is so unfriendly. Like, like the fear was. This is how my life is going to be for the rest of my life. Interesting. Okay, that makes sense. And it was your mom and your teacher who pushed you to go? Was that right? It was my, so it was more my mother. Uh, It was more my mother because I think she saw that I was struggling in town. And she said, "I, I want you to go see the world because I want you to understand that it's not, it's not like this town. And it's weird. My mom had a love hate relationship with that town because she does love the small town, you know, community and everything. But she also realizes it was a very white town. And there was, you know, it was a part of me that just kind of she saw me getting raised in these particular values. And it's just like, look, I don't want you to think that you are this because everyone in this town thinks you are, you know, like I want you to go. I think she understood because of her experience of leaving Thailand and coming to America uh the immense the immense scope of the planet that i think because she had also been well traveled you know like my 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 mother and father 
they had gone through Europe. They had gone through all these other countries and experienced the world. And, you know, they love to travel, this, you know, before my mother got sick. And so I think they found the value in travel. And so they, they encouraged me, like my mother encouraged me to go on this trip to Europe, especially, especially on my own specifically because they knew that I didn't like vacationing with them. And my parents, like they were awful, they were awful at vacationing in the sense that my father always just had a camera. He would just take pictures of things, but really it would mean nothing, you know, like click it's Hoover Dam. All right, where to next? And it's like, we didn't even really get an opportunity to even know anything about this place. Like, just like, to check a box. He just wanted to go there, check off a box, and then like race to the four corners and say, hey, put, put a body part in each of the four states so that you're standing in four states at once. Click, all right, let's go, right? And then at the same time, my mother didn't like being in pictures. And so I just looked like a kid that was like running away and like just taking pictures of myself in different parts of the world, like <laughs> in the four corners, in the rain, sopping wet, you know? And so like, there's all these pictures of me just kind of looking like, like lost, you know, just kind of like standing like, oh, here we are, you know, in Solvang or, you know, whatever, you know? And, and so, yeah, and, and my parents, because, like, my mother always wanted to plan with her Thomas guide, like, okay, well, we need to go there. Where my dad was like, where do I go? Like, while we're driving. My mom's like, you don't even, you're not even telling me where we're going, you know? Like, we went to Yosemite, and my mom's like, shouldn't we, shouldn't we rent a hotel before we go, you know? And my dad's like, no, there'll be plenty of hotels, you know? We get to Yosemite, going to all the hotels around the area, realizing they're all booked. And then I end up having to like sleep in the back seat of our station wagon with them. And I'm like, I hate traveling with you. You're awful people. <laughs> right. So that was my perception of vacationing. And it was just, it was just like, yeah, I think my mom realized like, yeah, no, you need to vacation with like friends. But you know, the weird thing about this trip was that the people that she perceived to be my friends were they weren't really friends. I mean, like I went to school with them, but they were the ones that were calling me a dork, right? And so that was the other hesitance I had for going on this trip. It was just like, oh, people that are well, I don't want to go on a trip with these people. Like yeah. they're just going to be picking on me during the whole trip. And then uh, my teacher, Mrs. Bjork, uh, you know, she was my speech teacher. We even had a little history because as great of a speech teacher as she was, she put me in this awkward situation where um, – there was 15 minutes left in school in junior high. And, and I think if you ask any adult, junior high is the worst experience of your childhood life, right? It's just where kids are just, they're just nasty. They're just, they're, they're just like, you watch things, you watch horrible things happen. And you're like, why did you do that? They're like, just cause, you know, and you're like, oh my God, I can't wait till I'm out, you know, I'm, I'm in high school or something, or I wish I was back in grade school, but not junior high. And so we had 15 minutes left in school after like a say no to drugs campaign and the kids are ready to go. But the principal, Mr. Fitzgerald says, no, I can't let you go yet. We've still 15 minutes left in school, but Mrs. Bjork has a wonderful surprise, you know, and she comes up to me with 15 minutes left with a gym full of all the angry kids in junior high. Right. And she says, Dan, I set some time aside that so you can do a, you can do a speech in front of the kids to prepare for your speech tournament this weekend. And I said, what? No, they don't, they don't want to hear a speech from me. She's oh, like, nonsense, wow. nonsense, you'll do great. Just go up there and enunciate. And I went up there and you could just feel the tension in the air. You can oh, feel God, love, my heart breaking for your. <laughs> and I grabbed, and I remember the principal giving me the microphone. The principal gives me the microphone and you could see, he, you could see the look in his eyes, like, like, I'm sorry you're about to die. And I remember grabbing the microphone. I remember grabbing the microphone and then just sitting there. And then I just started, I just started doing, I go, I went into this, I went into the speech and literally like 30 seconds into it, I start getting heckled. You're starting to hear laughter. Aww. The principal takes the microphone and says, I will give detention for the entire calendar year if you interrupt Mr. Santat, right? And like the kids, it was a herd of kids. Like, you're not gonna single out anyone. Like they're lost in the crowd, right? And so he gives me the microphone back and 30 seconds later, someone just shouts out this horrible thing to me. Mm. 
and God. then the entire gym, literally all 700 kids in this junior high laughing at me. And I'm standing alone in the center of this gym and I wanted to die. And it was, oh, and it was at that moment where oh, I thought I need to get out of this town. And as the years went on, it was their currency. It was, it was this currency of, of like, Hey, you know what? I may not be a cool kid, but I'm not that kid that literally died in front of the entire school. And it was, it was like kids just in order to not feel pain, they'll step on other kids' throats just to not, just to be one leg up. And I was at the lowest rung after that moment, you know? And I remember after that speech ended, the bell rang and all the kids were just going up and they're just, oh, you choked, you choked. And the principal was like, he had absolutely no control of the entire class. Kids wadding up papers and throwing it up and throwing it at my face and things like that. It was the worst moment of my life. Nice. And you would think that it would be weird. Like you would think that like having an experience like that, like you would never want to do public speaking ever again. Right. You would never want to stand in front. I of think that'd be pretty traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> right. But the opposite actually happened. You yeah. know, someone would say, oh, we need you to come up here and do this, this speech, you know, for five minutes. And I said, five minutes in a room of 30 people. Like, look, you're like, I I've been to the died. lion's den. I could tackle anything now. We died in a room of 700 and I'm still here. And so you're, you're asking me to do five minutes in front of a crowd of 30. I will, I will kill it, you know? So here's the weird thing is that despite the horrible experiences that I had growing up in that town, I would not give that up if I had the opportunity to live my life over again, because really? it shaped me into the person I, ha I am. And I probably wouldn't even be here with this memoir, speaking with you, mm. if I didn't have that as a part of my memory as a child. Like I would, if I grew up well-adjusted in Monterey Park, just a half hour away, I probably wouldn't be here. And I'm very happy with who I am, but it, it really, it, it's a matter of perspective and looking at yourself and seeing what can I, what can I learn from this? That's, that's really the important part of all of it. You know, you go through this horrible pain, but, and, and this, and this is what Mrs. Bjork told me, we have our ups and downs. How you react to them is, is what makes all the difference. Like, how is that going to shape you as a person? Like that was the most important thing she told me. And I remember she told me, you know, in the, in the, in the Prater amusement park in Vienna. And we were in, at the time it was the world's largest Ferris wheel. And I was, and I was feeling actually very sad because the vacation was almost over. Like the trip was almost over. And so, yeah, she just, we had a long conversation in this, in this, in this Ferris wheel. And I was just telling her, like, I'm really sad that I'm not going to be able to see these friends, you know, like who are from St. Louis, you know, like I really, I really connected with, you know, these folks and, you know, just saying, you know, listen, there's good, there's bad. It depends on how you want to shape that, you know, your life. You want to adjust to your life from these experiences. And so, yeah, that was, I gosh, man, I remember that. Here's the thing about a memoir is that when you travel back in time in your mind, that 13 year old self is still inside you like it was yesterday, you know? So there was a girl on this trip, her name was Amy. And I remember I would just think about these moments and then I would look at photos and then, you know, I would chat with her and like look at journal entries and things because she had transcribed her journal to me. And it just, it just brought back all these feelings, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, like, and I remember I would talk to my other friends. I would talk to other people like Shannon Hale and Raina Telgemeier who also did memoirs and I said, is it weird that those feelings are coming back? And, and they said, no, 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 that is completely normal. Like, mm -hmm. cause I thought it was weird. I was just like, I haven't seen Amy in 30 years. And literally like, we've only known, we only knew each other for three weeks. I hardly know the girl. Like, I don't know anything about her really technically. But when you're thinking about that one moment, when you're sitting in a park, looking at the stars, with her by your side, like 13 year old you is still, still very well inside that. And there's something about that that I just found really beautiful, you know? Yeah. And so being in that Ferris wheel with Mrs. Bjork and having her tell me that, 
I mean, I don't know, maybe there's, you know, there's some people that don't remember a lot from the trip, but for me, like, I remember, I remember how warm it felt inside there. I remember the smell. I remember like the patina on the wood inside. I remember watching the sunset with her. Like, I remember well, you were only 13 on this trip. Yeah. You were only 13 on this trip and you still. Right. And I remember, I remember it like it happened yesterday. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's what, that's, that's great. And despite yeah. not having a camera for that whole trip, like the memory is there. That's the best souvenir you can have is the oh, experience yeah. of it all. Oh, the experience yeah. is the best part. Now I do want to know. So you went on your trip, you're there for three weeks. You went as one kid. You came back though with a completely different mindset. So how did it change you when you got back home? The town, the hometown that I grew in felt smaller. It was no longer intimidating. Mm. You know, you go there and you look at this town and you're just like, these people are no better than me. Like, you know, like I actually feel sorry for some of them because they didn't have the experience I had, you know, and. and so your confidence went back up, went up? My confidence skyrocketed after that. Like I went to high school. Yeah. I went to high school and high school was so much better. And it really, it really like, gosh, to have someone get a confidence boost like that and really stick and really have an impact on that person is incredible, you know? And it was quite frankly for me, like it was a lifeline. You know, I don't, I don't know what the rest of my life would have been like if I didn't have that trip, you know, just to learn to like myself because here's an interesting thing I find is that when you go through the rigors of junior high and high school and you have to experience the clickiness of all that and the popular kids and the uncool kids, you know, a lot of these kids, they just come out of life. They come out the other end very angry, very cynical, or maybe they're like they're like longing for their longing for the good old days back when they were like the star quarterback of the football team or something like that. But you come out there, you come out of the other end uh, of eighteen, and like you're changed, right? Which is kind of why I like speaking with kids because they're still very innocent. They're still you know, there's the, they, they, they look at the world with open, innocent eyes. You know, by the time you get to the other end of high school, it's just like everything sucks. Everything's stupid, you know, um, and it's and that is something that's really hard to fix. You know, you carry that into adulthood. You have your own prejudices. You have your own biases. And if you're not open minded, it just gets deeply. It just gets embedded deeply like it gets rooted in your brain. Right. So, like I said, like I probably could have gone through life in that town. I mean, I, I did. I, I did kind of I did kind of come out of that town with a lack of confidence because there was there was this feeling of the the trip. But the, for me, it was kind of like, well, you know, is it a one off? Like, I mean, was that just a moment? And it wasn't until like I went to college and I met other kids from other places, and, you know, started with a whole new set of friends, realizing that there's so many people in this university that I could find my niche that matched perfectly. And was like, oh, my gosh, I wish I grew up with you guys in my town. Like life would have been so much better. Again, it's just that constant willingness to grow. You never want to be that person. You never want to be that person that stops and says, you know what? I'm happy with the way things are. I don't want to learn anything else. Like, I'm just happy with my little community because the world's just going to grow, continue to change and grow. That's entropy, you know? Like, that's just, the world's going to continue to grow and, and, and change. And if you don't change with it, then it's just going to leave you behind. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because usually I have on my show guests who tell me about their experience traveling as the parent with their kid. But you're different because you were the kid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's coming from you were the kid that traveled and just it was a life changing experience for you. Right. And it's like I, I, I hope other parents listen to this so that they know that get your kids out there, give them these opportunities. Don't wait, like you said, until it's already too late and they've already formed these worldviews, you know, right. start when they're young and, and yeah. just see obviously 
the experience you had is amazing and not every kid is going to experience this enlightening moment, but right. they're still going to have so many benefits from traveling. I mean, like you said, it's, it's, it's a big world out there and that's not just if you start with the kids, then it's, you have a better chance of getting them to see that. Right. Uh -huh. But even as adults, it's like, just get out there and then you'll, you'll just open your mind. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag with my kids. So like my older son's very much like my wife where, you know, he really likes what he likes and, you know, he, he's, you know, very hesitant to change or, or, or new things. Whereas my younger son, I, I don't even know if I can call him a son. He's like a clone of me. Like, as if like he just butted <laughs> off of me by meiosis. And it's like, I am raising myself. So <laughs> on one hand, on one hand, I have my youngest son that's like, what do you want to do today? Let's do it. Let's go. You know? And then I have my older son that's just like, mm, I don't want to do that. I'm going to stay here in the hotel while you're doing that thing. And it's like, you know, to each his own. I don't, I don't push them. I don't be like, get in that car and let's go to the National Museum. Like, you know, like you have to be willing and want to go out and engage with the world. But, you know, if you just happen to be in London and, you know, we're going to go to this thing, like, please, by all means, come with us. But if you, if you want to be in London and like maybe try like, I don't know, like a stargazy pie or something like that. And that's, pretty much the extent of your day, like I'm not gonna be mad at you. At least you're in London doing it, right? And yeah. I hope you at least appreciate the fact that you're doing something that less than probably 1% of this planet gets to do. Like to get to go to another country, like just appreciate the fact that you're that you're on the other side of the planet. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, Dan, I know you and I can just keep going. <laughs> Right, right. So, but uh, I, I love speaking with you and this I am so grateful for you to come on the show. Thank you so much. I am. We were talking about your book tour, which your book comes out in February. Yes. Um, and so people, if they want to see you, you'll be traveling around the, uh, the U.S. I know you'll be coming by me to yes. Naperville yeah. in Illinois. So I'm going to catch you there in March. Um, but I look forward to reading your book and following you. And it's been such a pleasure to meet you and speak with you. So thank you again for coming on to the show. Thank you. It's been a wonderful pleasure. Thank you.